Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lincoln Davies. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Law School and a member of the faculty and the Stegner Center. And it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce uh, Robin Craig and her lecture. Before I do that, I would like to just point out a couple of upcoming events uh, that the Stegner Center has planned and that you may all uh, be interested in. The first is on March 8th, which is the second Thursday in March. Uh, Stony Mesa Sagas by Chip Ward, who is an author and conservationist, um, here at the law school on, at 1215. Uh, and then the following week, uh, on the, uh, March 14th, uh, which is the Wallace Stegner Lecture from John Leshy, um, a true uh, legend in the field of environmental law, who will be speaking on debunking the creation myths of America's public lands. Again, that's March 14th, here at 1215, open to the public. And then finally, March 15th and 16th, that Thursday and Friday, um, all day is the 23rd Annual Stegner Symposium, which is on public lands in a changing West. Uh, registration is now available, so if you're interested, please go to the website and register. It should be a terrific symposium with a really amazing lineup um, and in, uh, introducing and exploring a lot of the fascinating questions about law and policy taking place on public lands today. Two final announcements before I introduce Professor Craig. Uh, the first is there's a sign-up sheet, so please take a moment to sign up. Uh, we use that sign-up sheet to keep in touch with you all and like to make sure you know about upcoming events, so please take a moment to do that. And also, if you're interested in reading Professor Craig's book that she'll be speaking on today, The End of Sustainability, uh, it is for sale out front from the King's English Bookshop. Uh, and I can tell you from having read uh, part of it yet, I haven't been able to get through all of it, it's a fascinating read and really interesting. Uh, so without further ado then, I'd like to introduce Professor Robin Kundis Craig, uh, my colleague and author of over uh, a dozen books and a hundred articles and book chapters, uh, truly prolific in the field, and I think fair to say a giant in the field of environmental law. Her expertise is wide ranging and deep, um, and I can also say uh, a dear friend. So it's my pleasure to yield the podium to Professor Craig. All right, well thank you Lincoln and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a book project that has been a long time in the fruition. So uh, my co-author Melinda Harm Benson and I were very happy to finally see it in print. Uh, and so I thought I'd just start off with what we thought we were getting into and why we ended up where we ended up uh, before I get into the argument itself. Uh, originally, we thought what we basically had was a science and law project, that uh, there's been a lot of developments in the science of ecology and where a lot of our environmental and natural resources are is not there anymore. Uh, so that uh, maybe it was time to think about updating it particularly in light of the fact that we're starting to experience impacts from climate change and other consequences of being in the Anthropocene or the new age of man, as this epic may soon be called. Uh, but once we started doing that, we realized we probably need to take a little broader view uh, because uh, what we ended up deciding is that American culture really lacks a cultural framework uh, to be thinking about natural resources management in the ways we need to be thinking about it for uh, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So, uh, back to the basic science issue. Uh, a lot of the United States' environmental and natural resources laws and policies uh, were written, say, post-World War II through about 1980 at the federal level. Uh, state versions in, in basically the same time frame. And at that point, the reigning scientific view of ecosystems uh, was what was known as the balance of nature, a kind of mechanistic view of the natural world uh, where you, know, you could understand what was going on and if you did something to an ecosystem and then backed away, it would tend to go back to what it was before, all by itself. 
Uh, that is the uh, Ecology's Enduring Myth subtitle of the book I put up there. Uh, is not where ecology is anymore, but law has not cut up. So why that matters in particular now is we're experiencing a lot of uh, new and accelerating changes to the natural world uh, that are underscoring how wrong our built-in paradigm of how the world works actually is. So I'm going to use a cartoon, an extended example of a little fish uh, to illustrate some of those points. Uh, so there's our fish. Pick your favorite fish species. Uh, it doesn't matter a whole lot, as I'll show in a second. Uh, but um, I should mention Mindy is the terrestrial person on this book. I'm the ocean person, so... We're going to be in the ocean for a while. Uh, our little fish uh, is uh, experiencing, among other things, some physical changes, some increases in temperature in most parts of the ocean, and changes in currents, and as a result, probably migrating toward the pole. Uh, this has actually been documented in a lot of different species, so. Uh, there are some of the average sea surface temperature increases around the globe. Uh, what's interesting about this is most of the coast of the United States is actually changing less fast than the rest of the world. Uh, but beginning uh, in about uh, 1995, NOAA started documenting for fisheries management purposes that some of the key commercially fish species uh, in the United States, particularly on the East Coast, were migrating out of the United States' waters and into Canadian waters, which is a management issue in and of itself right there. Uh, but if you read top to bottom for each species, uh, they're all migrating toward the pole northward where the waters are still cooler. Uh, since then, that's been documented for a lot of different species around the world. Uh, each of these ye yellow bars is a family of marine species, uh, some of them going northward, some of them going southward, but uh, already have an average shift of about 28 miles. Uh, and, you know, as for some groups of species, it's far more than 28 miles. So they are moving. Uh, and as a result, there's been some real impacts on fisheries, which will only continue into the future. Uh, if you're in the temperate regions of the world, uh, it's not so much that there are fewer fish overall yet, but they're different fish than they used to be. Fewer cold water species and more warm water species. If you're in the tropics, uh, you're actually seeing less fish, as the, that's usually the warmest waters on the planet. Uh, as those species are leaving, there's nothing to replace them. So uh, tropical fishing decreasing. And this, again, is kind of a widespread phenomenon. I know this is not the easiest picture to discern, but uh, the darker the blue line, the more species in that particular ocean system that are moving, uh, so and, and different types of species that are moving. All right, so back to our fish. It's hotter, currents are changing, our fish is moving. There's also some chemical changes going on. If you start warming up ocean water and you get to some other chemical changes as well, uh, dissolved oxygen is decreasing. And it stings. Uh, the ocean is acidifying. Uh, this is a side effect of the ocean being the world's largest carbon sink. I've uh, been absorbing a lot of human-created carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but the consequence of that is a drop in the pH of the ocean. This is the whole complicated reaction, but the basic formula is carbon dioxide plus seawater is carbonic acid, uh, and carbonic acid drops the pH of the ocean. Right now, uh, ocean pH on average, and it does vary from place to place, has dropped about 0.1 pH units, which is the equivalent of a 30% increase in acidity. 
Uh, that is the biggest change the ocean has seen in 650,000 years, uh, and it's not done yet. So the major impact immediately is what that does to plankton uh, or any shell-forming organism. So pteropods are uh, also known as sea butterflies, one of the indicator species for ocean acidification. Uh, as the seawater becomes more acidic, shell-forming organisms can't form their shells as well. These pictures were actually taken from a lab experiment to show what happens to the pteropods, but this has now been documented off the coast of Washington, state of Washington, which is one of the ocean acidification hotspots in the United States, uh, and is so prevalent that, in fact, the state of Washington is using pteropod damage as an indicator measure of how their ocean water quality is holding up. Okay. Now you start uh, extending that over time and uh, the ocean just kind of falls apart is the point of this Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, graphic. And you notice they've got mammoths running around at the left. Again, it's been a long time since the ocean pH has been changing. All right, so what else might our fish be facing? Well, not all species are migrating together. So we've got mismatches of predator-prey relationships that are developing again, been documented for a few marine species or terrestrial species uh, dependent on marine food. Uh, probably most famous are the puffin col colonies in the eastern coast of Canada. Uh, the uh, fish they rely on uh, during their breeding season are not arriving at the right time anymore. They're about three weeks late, uh, and so, uh, or three weeks early, and so the puffins are experiencing a loss of population. Polar bears are switching their feeding patterns from Arctic seals to subarctic seals, and uh, seabirds. Uh, Humboldt squid are changing with uh, their prey, and uh, you get other extended effects like invasive species of ants destroying the plants that various species of seabirds rely on. So all sorts of weird things going on with species running into each other. And then, of course, my favorite, as the Arctic Ocean is losing ice, we're going to have an increasing mix of Atlantic and Pacific species, <coughs> and to who knows what result, all right, but uh, unexpected. So that's, like I said, an extended example of what various populations of species in the ocean are facing, and it raises the question, uh, at least for me, how exactly are we supposed to be implementing the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act in the United States? Uh, the management goal encapsulated in that statute is that conservation and management measures for commercial fishing shall prevent overfishing while achieving on a continuing basis the optimum yield from each fishery. Uh, optimum with respect to optimum yield, in turn, is defined as the maximum sustainable yield from the fishery, as then you might want to reduce for any economic, social, or ecological factor. So we're basing all this on maximum sustainable yield. Uh, like I said, adjustable, but that's where you start. And I posit that's not possible to calculate anymore, and it's not just me positing it. Uh, there's been a lot of problems with maximum sustainable yield if you're into fisheries biology. Uh, it assumes, for one thing, fish that aren't needed for reproducing are surplus to the system, which common sense tells you they were probably doing something else, like being food for something else. Uh, but more importantly, it's calculated on a long-term assumption uh, that ocean conditions are stable. And as I've just shown, they're not. So NOAA, for example, uses a 30-year retrospective uh, view of what's been happening in each fishery to calculate what's going to be sustainable yield for the, the next management period. So um, that's the problem, the, the scientific problem as we see it. We're in a world where change is becoming obvious, and we've got a set of laws that are assuming 
a world that's relatively stable. Now, I said climate change underscores all this, but there was a misfit from the beginning uh, in that ecology has moved beyond this kind of balance of nature, uh, steady state view of how the world works, and where that comes out most clearly is in the theory of ecological resilience, which is uh, the one we are working with most extensively in the book. So uh, C.S. Holling or Buzz Holling uh, really came up with this theory, which posits that systems, complex adaptive systems uh, in the environment, are always in flux. Okay? They're always in flux. Uh, and he identified four different phases that they cycle through. A growth phase, uh, where the system is gaining species, gaining mass, gaining whatever is relevant. Uh, if you think about a young forest, this is when the trees are growing, uh, which progresses into a conservation phase, so a mature forest, lots of big trees, some little ones come up, a few trees fall down, but looking more or less like the same mature forest for a while. And then something happens, the release phase. With forests, it could be a forest fire. Uh, with a coral reef, it could be a bad El Nino event, all right, or El Nino event. Uh, but that release phase opens up energy, opens up space, uh, and the system starts reorganizing. Now, if things are relatively stable in the universe, it'll probably reorganize into something that looked kind of like what you had before. But if things aren't stable, you might get something new. And that's uh, what resilience theory also posits. So while all this is going on, there's two kinds of resilience that are important to systems. The first, with which all of you are familiar, it's called engineering resilience, and this is bounce-back resilience. So if something happens, how fast will the system snap back into what it used to be? All right, when we say a city's resilient after a hurricane or a person's resilient after an illness, that's the kind of resilience we usually have in mind, the bounce-back. Importantly, however, resilience theory has another kind of resilience called ecological resilience. And this is the ability to adapt to changing circumstances. All right, the ability to absorb some changes in chemistry, in physical conditions, in temperature, whatever, and still continue to function, but not in a bounce back state, in a new state or slightly altered state that's doing more or less the same thing, but by adaptation rather than bouncing back. Uh, and so it's that ecological resilience that's the important addition because uh, ecological resilience can take you different places as well. All right, so from there, that's our basic cycle. Uh, Buzz Holling and his PhD student Lance Gunderson then took that into a more complex theory of panarchy which posits that these adaptive cycles are going on at different scales. Uh, and that these scales interact. So uh, if you think in terms of climate change, for example, uh, the initial uh, changes in the Industrial Re uh, Revolution when humans began burning fossil fuels on a large scale, uh, the small-scale result of that was air pollution. Uh, and those of you who are fans of The Crown, you got an episode on the great... London fog, which was actually an air pollution disaster. We had quite a few of them in the United States. Uh, and that was the, the, the kind of decade scale effect of putting a whole lot of fossil fuel pollution into the air. We're now experiencing the century scale effect, which is the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which starts changing the climate. Ocean acidification is on the millennial scale, all right? That carbon dioxide has to cycle back through the Earth's geological cycle 
and it takes at least a thousand years for all of it to cycle back out. So, same phenomenon, burning fossil fuels, we have reactions going on at systemic levels at very different scales. <clears throat> all right, when you get that going on, the other part of resilience theory that's important is that you can push systems across thresholds into completely different states of being. Uh, the most common of these that is the subject of a lot of water pollution regulation uh, is eutrophication in freshwater systems. You start dumping nutrients into the system. You get algal blooms. You, the al algae uh, uh, decomposes, eats up the oxygen. You're changing the state of the system. As has also become clear, once you pass that threshold into a, a eutrophied system, getting it back out of that state, even if you cut off the nutrient loads, is really hard to do. And that's what that lower dip on the right signifies, that once you cross over into the new state, getting back out of it again is going to be harder than you thought. So uh, is this happening? Yes. Uh, grasslands changing into shrublands, the Arctic tundra is converting into something. It's either going to be grassland or shrubland. Nobody's quite sure where it's going, but one of those probably. Uh, this is a real management issue in Florida Bay, which uh, has been choked off from its normal flows of fresh water because of all the plumbing in the Everglades system in southern Florida. Uh, and as a result, uh, there used to be a very clean, clear water uh, seagrass system in Florida Bay. Uh, it's slowly but surely morphing into something that's got more algae in it. Uh, and so Florida is working very hard to try and restore those freshwater flows in the hopes of bringing it back to what it used to be. Um, and then the one I, if you've heard me talk before, you have probably mentioned at some point, is coral reefs. Coral reefs are basically sensitive to everything. Uh, you, you, coral reefs heat up, they bleach, they expel their symbiotic algae. That can lead to coral death. Uh, they're shell-forming organisms, so they're sensitive to ocean acidification. Uh, most of them have been overfished. And... Uh, pretty clear that most of the world's coral reefs are also transforming into systems dominated by algae. All right, so that's the science side. Why then bring cultural narratives in this? Because if we're going to change the law, there has to be a cultural basis in which to fit it. That's the simple answer. Uh, if, if we want radical transformation of the law, it's got to make sense in a larger cultural framework, and uh, we're telling ourselves the wrong stories, is what we ended up concluding. Us being the United States, I should mention that. This is, once you get into cultural stuff, is very much United States-centric. Uh, so, foundational ecological narratives in U.S. law. Uh, we identified three, roughly historically, uh, the manifest destiny narrative, the world is there for us to take, conquer, live in, explore, exploit, pick whatever verb you want, uh, very important to the settlement of the West, uh, but uh, creating a sense of human control over the natural world that was probably a little too aggressive, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> That uh, was uh, supplemented uh, by a tragedy narrative. This is kind of at the heart of the environmental movement in the United States. Uh, you can date it to a bunch of different events, but one of the, the uh, truly important ones was Rachel Carson's publication of Silent Spring, indicating that, hey, all these really neat chemicals that we've been using and dumping since World War II, uh, have some long-term effects, and particularly focusing on the effects of DDT uh, in bird reproduction. Uh, so a signal, hey, something's wrong, but uh, the tragedy narrative tends to figure human beings as the problem, the interloper, the destroyer. I, again, got some good uh, 
laws on the books, but in the long run, probably not as productive as we'd like a cultural narrative to be. Uh, and then last on the line, the one we're still in, is the sustainability and sustainable development narratives, uh, which are seeking to uh, balance the books and in the American version at least have it all. So I'll spend a little bit more time with those, uh, but if you've seen a, an illustration of sustainable development in the United States, it's probably one of the next two pictures. Uh, this one, which is called the Three Pillars Model of Sustainable Development, uh, social, environmental, economic pillars upholding a sustainable, sustainably developing society uh, where all three are important. Uh, this picture depicts the three realms as independent of each other, not involving trade-offs between them, which there are. Uh, and I, I looked and looked, but almost all versions of this picture put the environment in the middle, which means you can actually flick it out and <laughs> the roof stays standing, all right? Uh, so, and that, by the way, is not my observation. There's some, uh, some people who work on stories we tell ourselves that realize that as well. So uh, that's one model you'll see. Uh, this is another, the interlock, uh, interlocking circles model. It uh, does a little bit better job of conveying that there are trade-offs among the three spheres, uh, that the, the world of sustainable development requires that you give up a little a bit of everything as well as have a little bit of everything. Uh, but there's no bad place to be in this diagram, right? You can have a fair world, you can have a viable world, you can have a livable, livable world, you can have sustainable development, you can have social progress, you can have economic, you can ha I mean, there's no bad place to be here. So uh, it kind of, again, misses some of the point. Uh, the actual original illustration of sustainable development, which is now very hard to find in anything in American literature, uh, was the nested circles model, uh, where the environment is the outer circle, the defining limit of what's possible, very much recognizing that the other two realms, uh, society and the economy, are dependent on what's available uh, around them. Uh, and as a result, if you shrink that outer circle, you shrink everything. Uh, and so if you want to argue for sustainable development, I would say this is the model you need to look to. And that's being incorporated in some really uh, interesting recent studies, uh, the planetary boundary studies. A uh, large group of scientists, the papers are one of those where it's like 25 names, a uh, large group of scientists trying to define what actually is safe operating space for humanity. Uh, and they've identified nine boundaries they think are important. Uh, they had a 2009 version and then most recently a 2015 version, uh, and came up with where they think we actually are. Uh, a lot of interesting things about this diagram. Uh, first of all, the two they think we're actually most in need of correcting are loss of biodiversity and our uh, biochemical flows, meaning nutrient pollution, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. Uh, those are actually where we're in the high risk zone. Climate change is getting risky, but not quite to the level of those. Um, and uh, land use is also getting into the risky category. Uh, ocean acidification, they're not quite so worried about yet, but it could cross. Uh, and the two that the, the research identify as the two most important ones, because they can actually change the other boundaries, are that biodiversity prong and climate change. So if those get going into too much of the risky category, they actually change the other limit or the limits for the other seven. So um, that's where they think they are. But again, this is rethinking 
our relationship to the world. All right. Our climate change and Anthropocene narrative also need help. So our basic relational narratives need help. Our climate change narratives need help as well. Uh, so we've got four of the climate change narratives in the United States. Climate change isn't happening. The United States always has. It continues to lead the world in climate change denial. Uh, it comes up in a variety of different ways. Newsweek got a lot of grief for that cover because a lot of people ignored the little asterisk, <clears throat> but uh, also makes political cartoons. <clears throat> All right. Uh, second narrative in the United States, it isn't us. Climate change may be happening, but it's a natural phenomenon related to the cycles of climate change that have occurred throughout history. Humans got nothing to do with it. Uh, again, gets a range of coverage. All right, the third narrative kind of comes out of the manifest destiny narrative. Uh, which we chose to call the technology will save us narrative or the we can engineer our ways out of anything narrative. Uh, but basically, uh, this comes up most clearly in geoengineering that whatever problems may, we may come up or may have caused, we will come up with some technological fix for it, uh, whether that's an as yet undiscovered and undeveloped energy source or uh, mucking around with the atmosphere, or trying to muck with the ocean, uh, various ways to try and deal with it. But that actually comes out on lower scales as well. So right after Hurricane Sandy, uh, New York City was way looking into ways that they could technology-proof themselves uh, against a future such storm. And there was a proposal floated out there to build this huge gate that would supposedly uh, keep out whatever the ocean chose to throw at Manhattan, all right? Um, I've worked around the ocean a lot of times, seen some storms. The ocean winds. That's just a given, ocean winds. All right, uh, narrative four, it's the end of the world as we know it. Um, the fact that I could come up with out really thinking about it, a range of pop songs to fit this narrative. It's kind of indicative of how pervasive it is. Uh, but basically, um, what uh, anthropologists will tell you is that Americans, unlike most of the rest of the world, have a real investment in an apocalyptic narrative. Uh, it's kind of unique to us. It doesn't resonate with most of the rest of the world. Uh, but it pervades kind of everywhere in the United States. So there's a religious version of it, obviously, but there's a secular version of it as well. So if you will admit to having seen The Day After Tomorrow, that was very uh, popular culture embodiment of an apocalyptic narrative about climate change. Uh, a great book on, on the, uh, the cultural... Uh, Studies aspect of this, if you're interested, is The Last Myth by Gross and Gillis, tracing where the apocalyptic narrative in the United States came from uh, and where it's been going. Uh, but there are a couple of variations with respect to climate change that are kind of important. Uh, what I call the Carpe Diem Party Like It's 1999 narrative, uh, the illustration of which I will uh, blame on Forbes. Uh, but it was announced a few years back that the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet was inevitable. That was the scientific conclusion. It was going to happen as a matter of when. And uh, Forbes' reaction was, okay, well, if Antarctic melting has passed the point of no return, we should do less about climate change, not more. Okay? Party like it's 1999. All right. So, that's what we're up against in terms of cultural narratives. And before I get into why I think the trickster will help, what's important about all of those narratives is most of them are disempowering. Okay, Most of them are disempowering. If climate change isn't happening or it's not about us, or if it's the end of the world, pick your end of the spectrum, 
Uh, there's not a whole lot of role left for human beings. Uh, the, the, the tragedy narrative more generally is disempowering. Humans should just back out. We're the problem. Uh, and that's not helpful when you're trying to actually cope <laughs> with everything that's changing. On the other hand, we got a couple in there that are over-determinatively empowering. Uh, the technology will save us narrative and the manifest destiny narrative uh, posit that humans have too much control. And as resilience theory indicates, we've got some, we can clearly, influ clearly have influenced what's going on in the world, but not complete uh, agency in the universe. And it's that middle ground that we posit that we don't have a good cultural story for. Uh, trickster narratives, on the other hand, provide great stories and a whole range of great stories about that middle ground of agency. Uh, tricksters, by definition, are agents of change and chaos. That's what they do. All right? Uh, they are largely amoral. They are almost always he's. Several anthropologists noted that, so I will note it. Um, they're almost always he's. And they range the gamut. There are tricksters that are culture heroes. They bring light, bring fire. There's several raven and coyote stories from Native American uh, trickster stories. There's Prometheus in the Greek versions. Um, sometimes they're just comic. In a lot of cultures, the trickster figure is a comic figure. And sometimes they're downright scary. The most prominent example of that is Loki out of Norse mythology. Uh, that's their trickster figure, and he's brings about the end of the world. So, okay, um, yeah, but they range the gamut. Uh, they break down barriers, they break down norms, they challenge norms, they give human beings new things to cope with. But in the stories, human beings are usually pretty good at coping. Now, not in control, things don't go back to normal. They have to cope, but they can. Uh, and so, you get, a, like I said, a whole range of narratives that say, hey, change happens, and you can deal with it. Life may be different on the other side. You may now have light and warmth where you were in darkness and cold before. Uh, you may have to fight coyote for your fish because you're in an, a, a fish catching race. There's a whole series of stories uh, out of certain uh, cultures. Uh, but you can cope. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting about the trickster tales is they have a lot to say about greed. Uh, a lot of the tricksters are perpetually hungry and are always coming up with schemes to get more food, and they usually end up um, capturing themselves in their own schemes. All right, so there's like, some lessons about greed in there, and there's some lessons about the importance of community. Uh, that the, the way to cope with the trickster is a community-focused response. So we picked out a few trickster narratives in the book, but that's why we think the trickster helps. It's a better narrative. And anthropologists will tell you the Euro-based American culture is one of the few cultures in the world that does not have a good trickster tale. Okay? Okay. Murphy of Murphy's Laws, about as good as they'll give us, all right? So, uh, yeah, not something that's missing. And it also very neatly cycles back to the science because when Buzz Holling and Lance Gunderson were coming up with their theory of panarchy, the pan part of that was a double play, pan meaning everything, but also... Pan meaning pan the trickster, all right? This is a tricky trickster-based uh, view of the universe where we're always subject to surprises and change, all right? So it makes a nice cycle back. All right, so to finish up, what does that actually all mean for the law of natural resources? So we got our old stationarity view Social and human systems, and, or social human systems and ecosystems, are meaningfully distinct. The new resilience view says, "Hey, all relevant systems 
our social ecological systems. When I realize people have a problem with that term, there is no good term which is indicative of where we are, by the way, in terms of cultural narratives, to describe a system that is both human and everything else. All right, so social ecological system is the one that's used most pervasively. We went with it. I realized we need a new term, but we use the one that's out there. Uh, the old view, ecosystems behave in the future as they did in the past. Uh, new view, the systems are changing and will increasingly be transforming. The effects of human ecosystems, sorry, human actions on ecosystems are predictable. New view, surprises have always occurred, if we're honest about it, and will occur more frequently. Old view, human impacts are always reversible. Again, we kind of had a sneaking suspicion that wasn't true, uh, but the new view, so yeah, it's definitely not true. Uh, preservation may not be possible, and uh, restoration cannot be assumed to be achievable. I uh, and the old view, that manifest destiny creeping back in, we can and should manage for maximum sustainable human use. New view, yeah, we should probably be minimizing disturbance, building resistance, resilience of key elements, and increasing adaptive capacity for the changes that do occur, the transformations that do occur. So what's the most important question that has to be asked if you're redesigning law? If you're going to say we're aiming for resilience, cannot make everything resilient to everything else, not the way it works. So you got to ask, resilience of what? What are we privileging the management for? To what? What do we want it to be resilience against? Again, remembering we're going to be facing surprises. And for whom? So back to my fisheries example. Deciding that you want to management, manage for the resilience of the fishing communities against the shifting fish stocks is a very different management decision than say you, saying you want to manage for the resilience of transforming marine ecosystems against climate change and ocean acidification for future generations. You're going to do different things. And that is the challenge of importing resilience thinking into the law. Resilience theorists like to say they are not normative. They are just describing system properties. But in the law, we make normative choices. And that has to be done, uh, preferably transparently. And I will note in all this that not deciding to do anything is a choice. If we go on with management as usual, we have made a choice. So there is, there is a choice to be made. I would prefer it to be done openly and uh, with full knowledge of the trade-offs that we might be facing. So, and while we're on tough issues, uh, one of the points in the book is we acknowledge this isn't easy, but we think it can be done. Uh, consumerism, probably another social norm we should be working to change. Again, trickster tales can help. There's a lot of greedy tricksters out there that go hoist by their own petards. Um, population, yeah, nobody wants to talk about population, but that needs to be part of the equation. There's twice as many people on the planet as there were when I was born. That matters to the decisions you can make, all right? It matters how fast you can approach those planetary boundaries. And finally, linked fates, all right? Part of dissolving that barrier between our, the environment and us, which doesn't exist, is we're kind of all in this together. So you can add that in with globalism. You can add that in with uh, climate systems that are globe-wide. Uh, we're linked. And that argues in favor of a community-focused perspective, again, which the trickster tales help with. But uh, we also like to point out law has within it tools that we can resurrect. They've been lying dormant 
for a few decades now. Uh, we've had a very individualistic pendulum swing in American law. Uh, but we have the tools. There are things like public nuisance and public necessity uh, and re uh, increasing realizations by courts that different kinds of communities and property sit in changing ecosystems. So a lot of coastal property cases have recognized that the dynamic ocean is part of what has to be calculated into legal decisions about property law, which is probably one of the more conservative areas of law to be dealing with. And we have historical examples. And the one we pull out in the book is the mobilization during World War II. When you think about food rationing, when you think about uh, commitment of various kinds of resources to the war effort, if you think about changes that were made in uh, the workforce in the United States, changes the consequences of which we're still living with, um, we can do it. We've done it. We can come back to that community-focused perspective if we need it. So, the empowerment we see is that resilience theory warns us that undesirable transformations are possible, in some cases inevitable, but we can work to avoid the transformations we really don't want, and we can guide the transformations that are inevitable into something that ends up still being productive, even if it was different than it was before. Uh, we can, in fact, cope with that trickster. So, one last point. Resilience theory also tells us if we don't get serious about climate change mitigation, all of this is going to get harder. Well, thank you. Do we have time for questions? Uh, please come up to the mics so we can get it recorded. Uh, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> um, how does this new model of thinking affect the sort of general conservation narrative, and how would you suggest that this new narrative be imported into the world? Okay, so the question is, how does this new narrative uh, get imported into the world of conservation thinking? Uh, so, um, again, conservation of what is going to be an important question. But the tricky part is, again, preservation may not be possible uh, in all circumstances anymore. So if you're thinking in terms of conservation of species, uh, specific suggestions would make sure, be making sure that you preserve or open up corridors so they can migrate as they need to migrate. Uh, that we be setting up interconnected uh, preserves. So there's, again, room to move and change as the species need to move. Uh, there's an active debate on uh, assisted migration of species, uh, whether humans should be trying to step in for things like the pika that can't get from one mountaintop to another without help. Uh, all of that is in active debate, but if your question is how do we conserve Glacier National Park as Glacier National Park, that's one of the moments when we kind of have to say it's going to be something else. Maybe, in, you know, it will continue to be incredibly beautiful. We should be working to make sure that as it's transforming, we end up with a productive different system at the other end of it, uh, but to try and hang on to Glacier as Glacier, or pick your favorite ice-dominated system, uh, is, is not going to work for much longer. So that's, that's kind of the broad outline I would give you. Yes?
I think it is possible. I admit that it's hard. Okay, and that's why I bring up the example of World War II. That was a pretty large scale social transformation in a very rapid period of time. It can be done. Uh, it requires a lot of transitions that I and my co-author will admit uh, are not popular at the moment. So one of the suggestions in the book is we should seriously be thinking worldwide about phasing out commercial marine fisheries and transforming into the environmentally benign forms of marine aquaculture, of which there are quite a few. Uh, we say that because uh, one of the, the real risks at current rates is that food source, which is a critically important food source to a lot of developing and developed nations both, uh, is predicted to crash uh, from several different directions. Uh, and so uh, that kind of a transformation could be put in place, but getting the political will to do it is, of course, always the tricky question. Uh, and like I said, I think it is possible. I don't think it's easy. And I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I'm not sure I have a full answer to your question. But uh, it could be done. Robin, you spoke mostly of uh, the cultural and legal narratives within the United States. I was wondering if we could turn to the global world. Would you like to comment on uh, SDG 16 at the United Nations, uh, which is 17-point narrative that is quite comprehensive and quite extensive and quite inclusive. I, I'm not familiar enough with it to put it, I haven't put it into this context, so do you uh, feel like well, fleshing out the question a little bit? Uh, well, yes, DG 16 is uh, the next step after uh, the uh, the, the, the lack of result, uh, intended result of MDG, Millennium, 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 Millennium Development Goal at the United Nations. So after 15 years, that ended in 2015, came the new push uh, by the Global uh, Collective to go for the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 16, and that has a 17-point agenda that covers many of these issues, but on a global scale, but still country-specific, you know? And so I would like to see if you would like to look into that and see how your take uh, uh, goes with the other side. Because after all, in climate change, you know, there's, there are no such things as national boundaries, you know. It's a global issue and mig forced migration, you name it, human security, all of that, you know, is tied to that. And those things are all taken note of in SDG 16. And Ireland, the Irish Republic has taken the lead uh, to put that together. It was MDG, that was Michael Doyle primarily as the Secretary of, uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, initiated that early on, but now we are into this new phase. I'm sorry. Uh, what is that thing? I mean... Uh, Sustainable Development Goals? Right, but that's not SDG 16 though, what I see here. Okay. Okay. Um, my general answer is uh, if you are looking into sustainable development as a linguistic matter, what sustainable development sustains is development. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> if you look at the goals, at least as they're laid out here, uh, you know, very few of them are actually related to the environment prong of, of sustainable development. Um, you can look internationally. Again, this project ended up taking a, a huge look at cultural narratives, and we kept it to the United States because cultural narratives do vary considerably from country to country. We think there's a, a lot of interesting comparative studies that can be done. I've given this talk in a couple of different countries, uh, and in, in particular people from island nations, uh, have resonance with the trickster part of it and not so much with the, the U.S. climate change narr uh, narratives that we bring up. So uh, I actually have hope that this makes more sense in the rest of the world. 
mm-hmm. than, it, than it might make in the United States. But again, I remain highly skeptical of the whole sustainable development enterprise. Uh, and until there is broader acceptance of the fact that the environment is the limit, uh, the environment's what you got to deal with first, I, I, like I said, I remain skeptical. Definitely, but I would like to see that you take a look at that SDG 16 at the United Nations. And I, I will take a look. Right. Uh, like I said, I think there's a lot of room for a comparative work in this field, but I remain skeptical. Okay. That would be one word for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, yeah. I, I might put him, well, I won't say, but I, there's definitely ends of the scale I would put him at. But. Um, how, did you look at how religion plays? Obviously, obviously you did, but uh, certainly on a worldwide, I, I find it <laughs> fascinating to hear this, knowing... Uh, various uh, basis for religious thought? I, I mean, there's, there's a thousand ways religions play into this. Um, you know, I, for here, the most relevant part was the apocalyptic narrative. Um, climate change is actually being promoted in several versions of American Christian churches as the coming of end times, and happily, I might and which I find a little scary. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've got, you know, slightly less religious, the, the doomsday clock. Uh, so it comes up here. You know, how it plays out in other world religions, again, there's pretty good cultural anthropology that Americans are more strongly wedded to that apocalyptic narrative than uh, even Christian religions in other countries that are considered basically Christian countries, so I think there is still an American spin to that that's important. Um, I actually would love at some point, uh, and this book could have been an encyclopedia if we'd wanted to go comparative and and into the religion, I I would love to be able to spend time at some point what it means for religions outside of the Judeo-Christian Islamic context because it will be very different. I know enough to know that. I don't know enough to say anything more intelligent about it. But um, but I think, yeah, again, you know, taking this out of an American context and talking about it in different cultural contexts, I think is a, a very important step. Not something we could do in 250 pages, but yeah, would be fascinating studies. Any idea what words to use to convince people who are manifest destiny believers that there is That's the problem. I don't think that people who believe the manifest destiny part of it, which many do, I guess you're here, understand the trickster concept. Oh, uh, I, I think I think there's a reason why kids get fascinated with trickster tales. Um, you know, I actually did a, at one point for this book a full-on, there's a full-on series of kids' books on tricksters from around the world. It's great. I, you know, I, I think there's been a lot done on how to communicate about the changes that are occurring. And some of the important points are um, it can't be apop- apocalyptic. People stop listening when it's an apocalyptic message. So, we're trying to make ours very definitely not apocalyptic. Um, but it also helps a lot to relate to what people are experiencing in their own lives. So there's been a lot of work done, um, not in Utah, but in Iowa, with Iowa farmers who maybe don't want to hear about climate change a whole lot, but they know that their crop yields and their ability to grow certain crops are changing. And you can start there. What is your lived experience with the change? Uh, Have you been surprised by something? I mean, 
the East Coast storms, the fact that we're not getting snow when they're getting freezing airports they don't know how to deal with. Um, you know, we, we've got real examples of, hey, things aren't behaving the way we're expecting them to behave. Start there and build. Um, you know, and, and for the record, you know, the fact that we're not having snow this winter and the East Coast is getting dumped on appears to be directly linked to how bad the Arctic ice melt was last summer. You know, who knew? But that, that to me, is, is trickster in full force. So, yeah, that, that seems to be the growing wisdom is, you know, start where people are and be positive, be hopeful, be you can cope. Do we really want twice as many people in Utah, which are the projections for Utah? Uh, and if no, what do we do about it? Um, okay. <laughs> when I am asked to recommend things for reducing population, um, the, the things that seem to work best worldwide, I don't know how well this plays out in Utah, is to educate women and empower them economically. Birth, weight, birth rates drop when that happens. I think there are parts of Utah to which that advice could be applicable. And I will leave it at that. <laughs> well, yeah, we're also getting people moving here, so maybe make it less attractive than California, which is where a lot of people are moving from. So, uh, Run out of water would probably work, but that's not anywhere anyone, well, any of us want to go. So, yes? Yes. And, and you know what I actually think might help in the in this region is the evolution of what's going on with the Colorado River. That, that could be a region-wide model of how things have to be rethought at a fairly fundamental level. Uh, you know, as most of you probably know, the law of the Colorado River operates on the assumption that there's an average of 16.5 million acre feet per year, which has never in fact been the true average. It's off by at least a million and a half acre feet. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot going on in the Colorado River to try and rethink that dependence on uh, assuming a, a wrong and be a stationary model of how much water is in the system. There's also a lot going on in the West in terms of big reservoir and dam management, rethinking how those large systems need to be retooled in light of the fact that future water is not likely to behave the same way as past water. So um, I think we've got some good models developing that could be then, say, you know, could be examples of, hey, we did it here. This is the kind of things we thought about. Here's how it could translate into a different realm. Um, but, you know, changing the basis of law and policy takes some time, particularly if you've got to develop the, the new science and the new models as you're doing it. So uh, it's, it's time to start thinking about it, but implementation is going to take a bit. That's why we need to start now. Okay, thank you very much.
Oh, okay, yeah. I haven't bought it. I took it.